All right. Uh, good afternoon. I'm hoping you're having a, a great Sunday. Uh, I guess it's football season. You know, I'm on this uh, crazy European tour. So uh, today you, uh, you're getting me in uh, Geneva, Switzerland. Again, probably a first in the history of uh, the Blaze Radio Network for a live show to be broadcast from Geneva, Switzerland. So, uh, no, this is uh, this is uh, being able to catch up with you as I uh, travel through Europe and uh, travel through the world. I did a number of events in um, in France, in uh, in Paris. Uh, that was kind of interesting. Interesting to to talk about my ideas in um, in 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 Paris of all places, in France. Uh, I'll be there for the. Um, uh, for the uh, strike on uh, September 12th, the strike that didn't really happen, not much of a strike at all. And, uh, you know, witness uh, witness uh, the fact that, uh, you know, even in France, or maybe in France more than in other places, certainly more than in the United States, it seems, uh, socialism is kind of a decline. The, the, the rabbit socialism, the union uh, organizers are, are in decline, uh, Strike was was insignificant. Strike was insignificant in um, uh, in France. I'm now in Geneva, beautiful, beautiful city. Um, I, I'm on a hotel with with a view of uh, of the lake, the beautiful lake, and uh, surrounded by uh, at least to the south, I guess south, but really east and west. You you get the uh, the Alps mountains, uh, quite beautiful. A little cloudy today. Uh, it's probably going to rain most of the day tomorrow, but. Uh, you know, it's a beautiful location. Uh, Geneva is a beautiful location. I'll be giving a talk here at the University of Geneva uh, tomorrow uh, evening. And uh, we're going to be talking about uh, inequality, why I don't believe inequality is a problem, why I don't believe inequality is an issue. Uh, so um, that should be interesting, should be fun. Uh, those of you who uh, who might live in Switzerland, uh, invited. I don't know if I have any listeners. I know I actually do have listeners. I actually do have a few listeners uh, in uh, in uh, the Switzerland, in the Geneva area, and I expect them to uh, to be there uh, on um, tomorrow. So uh, looking forward to uh, looking forward to that. I then go uh, from there to uh, to Copenhagen, and in Copenhagen I'll be doing an event on free speech with uh, Fleming Rose. I don't know how familiar you guys are with uh, with Fleming, but uh, Fleming Rose was the guy who published the Danish cartoons in 2005 and caused, was it, well, didn't cause, but but as a consequence, there were those uh, massive riots uh, all over the Middle East. People died, and uh, since then, Fleming uh, has uh, massive security around him. His life is constantly under threat. Uh, the Islamist ISIS uh, constantly threatens to murder him and kill him. So I'll be I'll be doing an event with him in Copenhagen on Wednesday. If you are in Copenhagen, I know some listeners are from uh, Copenhagen, or maybe even if you're in Melmo in uh, in Sweden, come on, come on by. It should should be a great event. I think we're talking about free speech, multiculturalism, how a society can survive with uh, when there are multiple cultures and and when there are conflicts between those cultures in one geographic area, and it should be an interesting event. Uh, Fleming is, is a fascinating character, and, and it's always, always interesting uh, to do an event with him. I've been doing events with him since 2006. 2006, we did our first event on American campuses, showing showing the cartoons. We blew them up, made them big posters, and uh, had them behind us, and uh, we did panel of panel panel discussions on free speech way back in 2006, way ahead of the curve, way before uh, free speech became such a big issue as it is today on American campuses and uh, and elsewhere. So uh, if you're in Copenhagen, if you're around, come join us or fly into Copenhagen. Join us, uh, join us, and uh, it should be a great event. Interesting, we're doing it at the um, at the uh, Danish Parliament. And the reason we do it at the Danish Parliament is this is the second event I've done with Fleming there, is because uh, the Danish Parliament is a very secure building and security is a big deal, and uh, it, it you know if if last time I did an event with Fleming is any um, uh, you know is the standard we will have snipers on the roof we will have uh, policemen with machine guns everywhere 
uh, the security will be unbelievable. It, it will be, you, you would think, uh, I don't know, you would think that G8 was meeting or something, and it's just me and Fleming having a conversation. And, um, but, uh, you know, it's going to be exciting. It's going to be fun. So I encourage you all to come. I'm, I'm hoping I'm hoping we get that taped and we'll be able to put it up online in the future. By the way, those of you who don't know, I, I, I have a channel on YouTube. You can go to YouTube and, and search my name, Yaron Brook, Y-A-R-O-N-B-R-O-O-K. And I have a channel there. It would be great if you guys subscribe to the channel. I put up a lot of uh, videos, a lot of uh, uh, content uh, from from these radio shows and other radio sh- other kind of podcasts that I do. So uh, subscribe to uh, you know subscribe to my um, to my YouTube channel. You can also, uh, of course, subscribe to uh, follow me on Twitter and follow me or like me or whatever the hell it is on uh, on Facebook. I always get confused, and uh, and you'll get updates on on everything that I do and. Um, all the different events. Uh, October is going to be a pretty busy month in terms of events. I'm doing events in the United States, in Wisconsin, in uh, Minnesota. I'm uh, in, sorry, in, no, no, not Wisconsin, in Minnesota and in Michigan, in Minnesota and Michigan, in San Diego, uh, and um, I'm trying to, Wyoming, in Denver. So, so I'll be all over the country in October and early November, and you can uh, you can keep track of me if you follow Twitter or Facebook. Uh, I'll also um, I'll also be back in Europe in November, so uh, lots of events uh, planned for November in um, in the UK in in Great Britain, and then uh, and then uh, Poland and uh, Madrid. So that's kind of the November schedule, and then we'll see we'll see what happens after that. So uh, follow me that way you keep up to date. Uh, otherwise, it's it's really hard to keep track. Uh, uh, you know, you never know where I'm going to be tomorrow, right? Uh, well, tomorrow I'm going to be here in Geneva. All right, uh, let's see where uh, where are we? We are. Uh, I want to talk today about the fascinating article that was published a, a few weeks ago uh, in the Wall Street Journal, but I just discovered it uh, the other day, and it's it's I think it, it's 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 incredibly insightful and incredibly interesting about kind of the struggles of rural America and, and the reasons for those struggles. And, the, and what was interesting is that the, the article points out something I didn't realize. I kind of intuitively had a sense of it, but, but, but here they give statistics and they've actually measured this. And that is that in the past, when things got rough, when, when uh, jobs disappeared in a particular county or a particular district, particularly in rural America, but in the cities as well, Americans got up, and they moved. Uh, they moved when when farm jobs started disappearing because of technology, and and uh, people moved into the cities. And uh, when manufacturing jobs in various counties, sometimes in rural America, sometimes in uh, in, uh, in 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 the cities, started disappearing, people got up and moved to where the jobs were. And one of the fascinating things about this article is that that doesn't happen anymore. Americans are not moving. Mobility geographic mobility, moving from one place to another to find a better life, moving from one place to another to seek a better job, that is all gone. You know, people aren't doing it. And uh, this is tragic. And, uh, you know, I've, I've said this, I think I've said this on this show so many times that, you know, if you're in if you're in southern Ohio and steel jobs are going away, get in a car and drive to northwest Arkansas where there are plenty of jobs. Plenty of jobs, but Americans are not doing that, and 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 I had a intuitive sense of that, kind of just just casual observation type of sense that that was happening. But now the Wall Street Journal has provided some statistics and provided a list of reasons. I think they miss out; they 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 don't actually integrate the reasons, they don't come to a conclusion about the reasons. But I think they they have some fascinating reasons for why this is happening, and and that is what I want to talk about uh, when we come back after this break is I want to talk about the lack of mobility in America today, geographic mobility, which I think is crucial, crucial uh, for the health of the country, for the health of the economy, for the health of Americans uh, to return to a mobile country. And uh, but, but we'll talk that, about that after this quick break. You are listening to the Ron Brooks Show on the Blaze Radio Network. We'll be right back. 
And today, broadcasting from Geneva, Switzerland, Switzerland, uh, probably the freest country in, um, in, in Europe, and as a consequence of being so free, uh, also, I don't know if it's the richest country in Europe on a per capita basis, but may maybe one of my Swiss friends can, can let me know if that's true or not. But certainly one of the richest countries in, um, in Europe, uh, a, a, a terrific country. Uh, it, it's, always, it's always a pleasure to be here. Uh, standard of living's high, uh, nice cars in the street. I'm staying at a beautiful hotel right on the lake. Uh, and uh, it, it's just, it's just a, a pleasure to be here. It's always, it's always fun to be in Switzerland. You know, freedom works. What a shocker. Freedom works. It, it delivers the goods. Uh, uh, free... Uh, free markets, uh, rights protecting, uh, rights respecting, property rights protecting, property rights respecting, contract law respecting. All of that actually works in Switzerland, where I am right now, is uh, is a good example of that. So and it works everywhere. It, it doesn't matter what continent. It doesn't matter what what the culture is. It 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 it, it actually works if you if you get the system right. I mean, some cultures you have to give it some time. But ultimately, it always works. And yet, nobody learns. Nobody, nobody ever learns. It's, it's astounding. Anyway, talk about not learning. The United States is probably the country that has the most uh, examples from which to learn. It is the country that used to be the freest and, and used to be the richest and, and used to be the, the, the most flourishing and prosperous and everything else. And, and it used to have... A labor force that was incredibly mobile. Uh, people would get in their cars or get on trains or get on wagons and horses and move to where the jobs are. And one of the things that made America such a, uh, an economic dynamo was uh, the fact that you could combine labor and capital and, and, and efficiently use them and efficiently uh, as, a, as a consequence of this freedom, but not just freedom, but the, the, the willingness of people to take a risk, to, to leave uh, their home, to leave their family, and, and to go somewhere, and to go to the unknown, and, and to go take a job in a place they didn't know, and, and to go take a job where, where the capital was, where, where, where people were investing. So that in the 1980s, huge numbers of people moved to Silicon Valley and moved to California, and still there's some movement into California, although it's hard. The state of California makes it very difficult in order to take advantage of this incredible technology boom. And people left the Midwest because Midwest was to a large extent dying and, and they, they went to where there were jobs. In, in the 1980s, another thing, another phenomenon that was happening was that, uh, that black, blacks who, who were engaged in, in work and manufacturing jobs in the Midwest and elsewhere, and, and those jobs were disappearing, were actually going back to the South uh, where they had come so, so in the early part of the 20th century, blacks moved from Jim Crow laws and, and discriminatory South to the North, to Detroit, to other cities in the North in order to take advantage of all the manufacturing jobs they and of the fact that there was less discrimination and uh, of the fact that there was more freedom for them in these, in these other countries. And they, they moved from, uh, you know, from rural agricultural South and discriminatory Jim Crow law South to the North, uh, where suddenly many of them became part of the middle class and became part of part of industrial America and and, and did very well or did did well uh, as as the U.S. as U.S. manufacturing did well during that period, and then during the 1980s when those manufacturing jobs to large extent disappeared, where where I you know a series of bad laws and and bad policies in the Midwest. Uh, destroyed those jobs and, and destroyed those economies. Th those same black families moved back to the South and they moved to Atlanta and they moved to Ch Ch Charleston and they moved to uh, North Carolina and they moved to places in the South that were booming and places in the South where there was more economic freedom and places in the South where there were jobs. And now the discrimination in the South had declined. They felt free to, to, to go to the South and, and to... to Again, raise their standard of living, and, and blacks in the South have been doing better uh, as a consequence. But, and then, of course, there is the uh, there is the 1930s and 1940s, and even 19 to the 1950s, uh, and really, it started before that. It started in the 1920s as agriculture became more and more efficient, and as agriculture became more and more mechanized, as agriculture became more and more corporatized. 
that a small farm started disappearing because the advantages of scale that technology brought made the family farm basically uh, unworkable and, and made it uncompetitive. Uh, people, you know, it used to be that 80% of the American population, I think 100 and something years ago, 80% to 90% of the American population were farmers. And today it's less than 1%. Where did all those people go? Well, they got up and they left the farms and they went to the cities or they went to small towns and they changed jobs and they found jobs and they, they, they did well. America has done well over the last hundred years. Americans have done well over the last hundred years. I don't know if you saw the statistic, but uh, just uh, I think last last week or the week before, it was announced that um, median income has hit the highest level in the United States in history. I think it's it's fifty nine something thousand dollars. Uh, you know we've done well, and so people used to move. But what's interesting today is that in rural America today, in Trump country today, among the people who voted for Trump, there is almost no movement. Uh, here's the, here's the, this is out of Wall Street Journal story. The rate of people who moved across a county line in 2015 was just 4.1%. A county line. We're not talking about states. We're not talking about county was 4.1%, according to Wall Street Journal, right? That's down from 7.7%, so almost half, um, in the 1970s, in the late 1970s. Uh, and it's fallen faster in, uh, now it's fallen in metropolitan areas as well. So in metropolitan areas, people are moving, mobility is less, and you can see that. People are not leaving places like, I don't know, let's say Cincinnati, Cleveland, like they did in the 1980s. Uh, it, 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 today they're not so. It, but in the rural America, it's 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 dropped even faster than it has in metropolitan areas. So now, the mobility rate in rural America is lower than the mobility rate in metropolitan areas. And here, mobility rate means literally mobility, literally moving to another state. So, in spite of the fact that today unemployment in rural America is higher than it is in the cities, in spite of the fact that they are. There's a massive shortage, uh, uh, truly a massive shortage of, of high-skilled or skilled labor uh, in certain metropolitan areas like Nashville, like Denver. There are jobs in Nashville and Denver. People in rural America are unemployed who are poor are not moving to these places. Not moving to these places. Sharp decline in, uh, in people's willingness to move. Uh, uh, you know, we used to have, um, just to give you a right, that in, um, it, right after World War II, looking at these, some of these numbers, mobility rates were something like 20%, and today it's under 4%. So I think this is interesting. And of course, life is not good for these people. And the, and, and the Wall Street Journal documents a number of stories of individuals who, who hate living in, in their little towns, who, 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 who want a different life, but find themselves trapped psychologically trapped more than anything else, but we'll get to the reasons why they are trapped, but trapped in these rural communities, trapped in dead-end jobs, trapped in dead-end lives, and are not pursuing their own happiness, are not seeking a better life. And that's sad. It's sad and it's un-American. We are the people who pursue happiness. We are the people who will do anything to make our lives better, to improve our lot in life, and yet so many Americans, millions of Americans today are not doing that. All right, you're listening to Iran Book Show. When we get back, we'll talk about why this is happening. All right, this is Iran Book broadcasting today on the Blaze Radio Network from Geneva, Switzerland. And we're talking about we're talking about the lack of mobility uh, in America today, the, the lack of willingness of people to get up off their feet and, and move. By the way, um, uh, if you have any uh, any ideas on why, or why you think this is happening, uh, give us a call, 888-900-3393, 888-900-3393. Uh, do you live in rural America? You know, what's life like? Good? Great? Uh, you don't want to move? Or, or what? I'm really interested, particularly interested in hearing... Um, if you, if you would like to move, but you feel like you can't, 
or like there are no possibilities or there are no options uh, for moving, then uh, I'm curious. Let, let me know. Give me a call, uh, 888-900-3393. If you live in rural America and you don't think anybody should move out or you think people are not moving and there's, there's, there's a reason for that, I'm curious what you think the reason is. Um, you know, yep, uh, somebody just wrote uh, online that they are, uh, they moved over 30 times uh, for their job, but they're burnt out. Yeah, after after 23 times, I'd be burnt out too. I've moved many, many times, large distances. Uh, I'm likely to move again soon. Uh, more on that another time. But, um, but 30 times seems a little too much, a little too much. That I'd get, I'd get burned out. I'd get burned out by 30 times. I get restless around, you know, seven or ten years in one place. Uh, that's about as long as, you know, I, I really get restless. And I've been, I've been kind of in Orange County, California, living in Orange County, California for what now? Uh, 17 years, 18 years. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm burnt out on staying in the same place. So uh, time, time to move. All right. Um, so why is it? Why, why is it? And, and it's interesting, the story in the Wall Street Journal they talk about this one county, I think it's in Michigan, uh, Og, uh, Ogemaw, I'm, I'm butchering the name, O-G-E-M-A-W County. It's a tiny county, 21,000 residents, but only one in a thousand has moves in a year. One in a thousand. That's amazing. And it, it's interesting because young people want to move. They say they want to move. They say they don't want to stay. They say they want a better life. They say they want to improve their lives. And yet, in the article, and yet they, they say they can't move. They, 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 they just can't make the switch. They try. They come back. They, they just can't do it. Something is stopping them. And, and it's interesting. It's interesting that that, that is actually happening. Um, and it's not that they're doing well. So here it says that the thrift store manager... In St. Vincent, uh, at St. Vincent de Paul, which I guess is is uh, is in West Branch, it's uh, you know, oh, it's the St. Vincent de Paul thrift store in West Branch, which is in the county. He says that eighty percent of queries of financial help come from people under age thirty-five. Now that's sad. That's incredibly sad when people under the age of thirty-five need help. This, these are the, the 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 exciting years of life. These are life in which you you're setting out on a career. This is this is when you're you know, moving forward in life, achieve, starting to achieve things, starting to build some wealth, some build some skill to build your what's called human capital, your skill set that, that'll last you for the rest of your life. And yet, you know, they're, they're not going anywhere. They're stuck. They feel stuck. Why? Why? All right, so let's, let's get some of the reasons the article points out, which I think are, are fascinating. Because what you find is that all the reasons that the article points out are consequence of big government. The, the reason is statism. The reason is government programs, government involvement, government intervention. What, what the article doesn't point out is the, the psychological cost of these. It's showing the existential cost. But what it doesn't show is the psychological cost, which is ultimately what is responsible. For the inability of people to move, the inability of people to take risk, the inability uh, of people to actually change their lives in meaningful ways. So what are the what are the problems? Problem number one, huge difference in the cost of housing between rural America and and uh, and you know the city. So people who want to move to the city, they just can't afford it, even though they're gonna get paid more in the city. You know, the cost of housing is such today that it eats up huge percentage. I think they give an example of, of, of somebody in a, a, a lower skilled job, 50% of their income would go to housing. Now, this is not a consequence of the market. This is not a consequence of capitalism. This is not a consequence of freedom, of freedom. This is a consequence of government regulation. And the article says that. I, I mean, the article's a good article because it identifies all the statist reasons that are causing this lack of mobility. And what they're saying is that land use regulations all over, you know, all over cities in America causes the cost of housing to go up dramatically. 
particularly at the lower end. Because that is the kind of housing it's not economical to build, giving those restrictions. Because the restrictions on the type of housing, because of the restrictions on when, because of the restrictions on quantity, developers are going to build housing where they can have a margin, which means middle class and upper class housing. And they don't build, you know, uh, starter housing. They don't build housing for young people. They don't build housing for low income individuals. That's not because they don't want to. That's because they can't. The regulations, the, the housing regulations, the whole variety of building codes and land use regulations make it too prohibitively expensive to build that kind of housing and therefore they focus on where they can make money. And as a consequence, it's too expensive for people to move to where the jobs are, for people to move to where they can increase their standard of living, to where they increase their quality of life. It makes it impossible for people to move to those places where they can have a better life. Now, there are probably exceptions to this, that cities like Houston, where it's relatively cheap, housing is relatively cheap because there are no land use regulations and the regulations in terms of housing and so on. Now, right now, not a great place to move to, given the flooding, but it, it was and will be again, and, I, and, and my guess is other places in, 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 uh, in Texas, and there, there are certain cities where housing is not that expensive. So this explains some of it, and there's no question it explains some of it. But it doesn't ex explain it all. Uh, housing is unbelievably expensive. By the way, not only in the United States and the cities. This is true of London. It's true of Paris. It's true of almost every city in Europe. And the reason is that, uh, that in all these places, environmentalists have forced these land use regulations, have forced green spaces, have forced restrictions on building high or restrictions on building new or restrictions on building fell in the blank. And there is a massive shortage of housing. And when you have a shortage of, shortage of housing, but high demand, because people want to move to these places, because these places are where there are opportunities, what do you get? When demand is high and supply is limited, you get increasing prices. And that's what you're seeing all over the world, particularly, again, all over the world where environmentalists have any say in things. What you're seeing is, is massive increases in the price of housing because of these anti anti-life, anti-human life in environmentalists. Um, all right, so so cost of housing, one government program that is that is making it difficult for people in rural areas to uh, to actually move to uh, to the cities where the jobs are and to actually become more mobile. All right, um, if you live in a rural area, if you live anywhere, I don't really care. Uh, if you want in, if, if you've got a question, question about anything, you know, it'd be nice if it was about this topic right now, but a question about anything, really, give us a call, 888-900-3393, 888-900-3393, uh, and we'll continue discussing all the statist regulations that are bringing about this lack of mobility, the, cl the, the, the restricting on the pursuit of happiness in America today, how the state is destroying it. Uh, when we come back after this break, you're listening to your own book show on the Blaze Radio Network. All right, we we are uh, we're talking today about mobility, about the lack of mobility in America, the fact that people don't move anymore. And, and uh, you know, uh, I I've moved all my life. I've always moved to 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 find better pastures and and to find a better life and to seek out opportunities. My father did the same thing. My my parents were actually born in South Africa. I don't know how many of you know this, but my, my mother was born in Durban. My father was born in Johannesburg in South Africa, on the other side of the world. And um, they didn't want to stay in South Africa. They hated apartheid, uh, and they dreamt of, of living in Israel. And, and uh, they, they got married, and immediately uh, after the wedding, got on a, sh on a boat with nothing with nothing, and, uh, and sailed to Israel. And, and I was born a year later in Jerusalem. And throughout my father's career, he, he moved to where the opportunities were, and he, and he took advantage of that. He, he spent time in the United States. He spent time in England, even within Israel, tiny little Israel. We lived in, uh, you know, three different places, three different town cities uh, in Israel, Jerusalem, Elat, which is at the southern tip of Israel, and, and ultimately in Haifa. And then when I, when I grew up and, and uh, 
I, I decided Izzo was, in a sense, too small for me. Uh, he, he didn't allow for the opportunities that I wanted in my life. So I got up, and again, with nothing, with, with two suitcases, uh, my wife and I got on a plane, and, and my wife had never been outside of Israel. She'd never been on a plane before in her life. And yet she got on a plane and, and we traveled to the United States and traveled to a place we, we'd never been before, to Austin, Texas. I thought I was coming to the middle of the desert. Uh, I didn't realize how beautiful and amazing and green, actually, uh, Austin, Texas is hot and humid as well. But, uh, you know, and went to school and, and, and got my MBA and my PhD there. And, but, but, you know, took, took off and, and had belief in, our, in ourselves and in our, in our ability to succeed, and yeah, housing was going to be expensive, and yeah, it was going to be tough, and yeah, we didn't know what to do about a healthcare insurance or anything like that. We and we managed, and then you know, once we loved Texas, and we had great friends in Texas, and we had a great time in Texas, and both my both my sons were born in Austin, Texas. But then, uh, when 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 the best job opportunity I had was in Northern California, I took it and became a university professor. It's a it's a, it's a place there, and then. When a different job came about that was better and, and would lead to a better life, we moved to Southern California. And, you know, now we're getting ready to move again because there are better opportunities. And uh, you, you got to – moving, moving is, is – you know, it's part of life. It's part of the pursuit of happiness. It's part of the self-improvement. It's part of, part of finding better opportunities for yourself – and, and for, 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 for doing the maximum of life, just because you were born in a particular place doesn't mean that particular place is the best for you. It, it's just arbitrary. It's just random. It's just a fluke that you were born in a particular place. Go to where the best opportunities are. This, by the way, is one of the reasons why I am so passionately pro-immigration. And, and why I believe in a, in a dramatically expanding legal immigration in the United States. Because there are people who are ambitious, people who are good people, people who want to work hard, people who want to succeed in life, people who want to maximize their opportunities and would like to come here to do it. And and building a wall to stop them is, is nuts in my view. And, and, uh, and, and you know, welcoming them and, and, and enjoying the opportunities that they bring with them is what Americans have always done and Americans should continue to do. But think about Americans. Americans have always moved from the east to the west, from the north, from the south to the north, and then from the north to the south, from the rural to the to the to the city, from the city to the suburb, from one suburb to another, from one state to another. We are a nation on the move in pursuit of our happiness, in pursuit of the best, in pursuit of the best job, in pursuit of the best life, in pursuit of the most opportunities. And the fact that mobility is disappearing is sad. We are a nation founded by people who got on ships and sailed into the unknown, crossed an ocean in order to get to a place that they didn't know they would have a job, they didn't know they would have a house, they knew nothing about it. There was no internet, there was no television, there was no radio, there was no phones, and yet they showed up in this place. And the government didn't help them, and the government didn't stop them, and the government didn't, but the government didn't provide them with social benefits, ga housing guarantees, Medicare, Medicaid. They, they weren't restricted by licensing laws. We'll get to all of this after the next break. They just did it. And, and think about the, 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 the confidence and the self-esteem and the risk -take, willingness to take, to take risks. And, and the great American tragedy today is that we've lost that. We've lost the willingness to take risk. We've lost that willingness, that confidence, that that self-esteem that, that says, you know, I can move anywhere. I can do anything. I can go anywhere, and I'll be okay. I'll be okay. I'll be better than okay. I'll do great, and I'm going to make my life the best life that it can be, and that means, if that means moving a 1,000 miles, it means moving a 1,000 miles, and if that means switching jobs, it means switching jobs, and if that means taking some time off to, to retrain myself, it means taking some time off to retrain myself. There are no limits as we'll see, the only limits that exist were created by government. All right, so we're talking about this lack of mobility, and when we come back after this pretty long break, I want to go over, I've got another six reasons that the article lists uh, of how the state, how the government is limiting our mobility, how it's creating 
creating a hazardous environment for us to actually move. All right, you're listening to the Iran Brooks Show on the Blaze Radio Network. And we'll be back after this break and some news. All right, welcome to hour number two of the Iran Book Show, broadcasting today from Geneva, Switzerland. It's uh, it's about, what time is it over here? It's about 9, uh, 9.06 uh, p.m. Not as bad as when we did this uh, from Bakwa, Azerbaijan, where it was, uh, it was a couple of hours uh, even later at night. So uh, not too bad here in Switzerland. All right, um, if you want in on the conversation, we're talking today about the lack of mobility in America, the fact that people are now moving from state to state, from county to county. They're now moving to, to seek new opportunities, new jobs, uh, a better life. Uh, you can call in 1-888-900-3393. One, <laughs> let's do this again. 888 <laughs> Nine three. All right, if you have any stories of moving or, 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 or stories of how you sought a better life by moving, or, or just if you have any comments on, on why it is that people are now moving and how the government is, in a sense, restricting our mobility, feel free to give us a call. And we've actually got Bill on the line. Bill from California uh, wants to talk about this topic. Hey, Bill, how's it going? I'm okay. How are you? I'm, I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say that um, I really admire you, and I, I very much appreciate the work that you do. And well, I urge everyone to support ARI and uh, help fund the work that you that you continue to do. Well, I appreciate um, it. ARI is the Ayn Rand Institute. Uh, some people are not familiar with the acronym. Uh, so, 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 uh, tell me, Bill, what what kind of experience do you have in terms of uh, moving around the country and and uh, and in terms of government and mobility? Well, um, I was uh, born and raised in Wisconsin. And when I was a teenager, the, the, uh, we were, the Jimmy Carter administration was just coming on. And there was no work in the Midwest whatsoever. So I packed up my bags and I hitchhiked out to California and I found work here. The, the California was booming. There was construction everywhere oh, at this time, at that time, and it was easy to find a job, and it was inexpensive to live here. But now, uh, since everybody from the, the all the liberals from the East Coast moved out here uh, in Ventura County, I live in Ventura County. We have something called. Uh, an organization called Save Our Open Space. So the, we'll, we have a lot of agricultural land here, but it's becoming more and more difficult to farm it because uh, a lot of homes have been constructed around the uh, yeah. agricultural land, and uh, more and more uh, laws have been put into place that restrict the use of pesticides and herbicides and fungicides. So it's becoming more and more expensive to farm, and um, there's a labor shortage because of the immigration problem. Uh, so farming isn't really that uh, 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 profitable anymore. Pay yeah. off that well now. Yeah. But uh, the Save Our Open Space is an environmental or organization that has gotten a law passed that for the next 20 years, no agricultural land can be used for housing development whatsoever. So, so basically, everything they that's calling themselves ag- Keep People Out, the Keep People Out Foundation. Yeah, and it's also pushed up the cost of housing um, to unbelievable sure. Uh, prices. Sure, sure. Well, maybe now's the time to sell in California and and uh, and uh, and move somewhere cheaper. Um, yeah. Well, my wife and I are both retired, and uh, actually, we are thinking about that. Yep. Yep. Good. Well, thanks, Bill. Thanks. Thanks for listening. Thanks for calling. And. Uh, uh, you know, hope good luck with uh, good luck with the move if if you decide to make one. But uh, Ventura County is hard to leave. It is really beautiful, beautiful, uh, beautiful country. Beautiful. Yes, country. it is. Thank you very much, and best premises. Sure, best premises to you. All right. So uh, beyond uh, beyond, uh, Bill was t- was saying how 
you know, the, the land use restrictions driving up costs and making it impossible for people to move into Ventura County, California, for example. But there are other, other reasons this article in the Wall Street Journal that describes this lack of mobility in the United States has. For example, government aid programs. Remember, a lot of these people in these rural counties are poor. They're on Medicaid. And it's very difficult. Every state has different Medicaid uh, programs. And it's very difficult to move from one state to another. You might not qualify in a different state, or the benefits might be different. And you're used to getting the benefits that you're getting. So Medicaid holds people back from moving. And this is true uh, above and beyond Medicaid, other kind of welfare programs. So many welfare programs in the United States are state-based and local-based that people are afraid to lose the benefits. And if they move, even if they get a better job, it might actually be a reduction in income because of all the welfare they get and all the benefits that they are getting. So it incentivizes people to stay put, to stay poor, to stay dependent on the state. Also, uh, in rural areas today, there is a lot of low-income housing. You can't build it in, in the cities because it, it's very difficult. It's very expensive to build low-income housing. Okay, think about that contradiction, because of land use regulations and because of generally housing regulations. But you can build low-income housing in rural areas, and there's a lot of it. Now, low-income housing virtually didn't exist in rural areas a generation ago. There was no low-income housing. Here, I mean low-income housing subsidized by government. So the government is subsidizing your housing. They're subsidizing your health care. They're subsidizing your income. And all this provides you a strong incentive not to put any of that at risk, not to move anywhere. Now, the, this welfare mentality, I will call it, this entitlement mentality, this dependent mentality, extends beyond that because rural areas are also quite charitable. They're, they're not so much charitable in terms of, of direct charitable contributions, but in terms of just the network that you've probably established if you're poor and dependent. On, uh, whether it's church groups or, or, or just uh, businesses that might not charge you because you're, you, you're going through bad times. It, there's a whole community built around this, but, but this is, again, there's a whole culture of supporting dependency, of encouraging dependency, of sustaining dependency. It used to be true that in America, it used to be that we would help our neighbors, but we'd help our neighbors get on their feet so they didn't need our help anymore. But today, the mentality that the government and the welfare state is instituted within us is not to help us get on our feet, but to sustain us on our knees, to keep us crawling and begging and, 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 and dependent. But here's, the, here's another killer. This, this one, I read, I knew about this, and I've actually talked about this, and I use this as examples in my talks all the time, but it never hit me in the context of mobility. But this is interesting, right? State-level job licensing requirements, particularly on low-skilled professions, from bartenders to florists to turtle farmers and scrap metals recyclers, they all need state license, which costs money. And if you have a state license in state A, it doesn't necessarily transfer to state B. Another state license in state B. So here you have, uh, uh, you know, these licensing requirements are supposed to protect us. I don't know from whom exactly, but they're supposed to protect us. And what they're really doing is they're institu institutionalizing people into poverty. They're preventing people from moving. They're preventing people from working. They're preventing people from advancing in their careers and their lives. I mean, the Obama administration actually had a report about this uh, that, that, that sounded the alarm over uh, these licensing requirements. You know, one of the very, 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 very few things that the Obama administration it, it didn't do anything but said that was good. And they said that more than one quarter of U.S. workers today, more than a quarter, more than 25% of U.S. workers today, require a license to do their jobs. That is a five-fold increase since the 1950s. Five-fold. And that explains so much. You know, you, you can fight poverty all you want, but if you don't 
provide people with jobs, if you don't make it easy for people to move, if you don't make it easy for people to adopt new jobs and to advance in their jobs and to invest in their jobs, if you require them to pay licensing fees, if you require them to, 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 to take their hard-earned money and, and have to spend it on a government license, then you're destroying their opportunities. You know, uh, nationwide, a study showed that barbers and cosmologists, you know, occupations that tend to require people to play new state licenses when they relocate. So every state has a different license for barbers and cosmologists. Because God forbid what that bad haircut might do to you. We need a licensed barbers. We need the state, the government, to give barbers a license. We need state authorized barbers. So they are 22% less likely to move between states because of these licenses. I, I, and it makes me so angry. And it should make you so angry. And nobody talks about this. Nobody talks about this. I mean, there's one institution that does a good job about fighting this, which is, um, which is the Institute for Justice, which sues states over the, some of these licensing laws. But so much more could be done. I was the president of the United States. These people are the ones who voted for him. Shouldn't he be seeking their interests out? What about a what about a federal law that, you know, in spite of the, the, the this goes against federalism that bans state licensing of professions, any licensing of professions? Suddenly, blue blue collar type of jobs like this. I mean, it's it's absurd. I mean. I can understand why people are a little reluctant to do away with licensing of doctors. We can debate that. But barbers and cosmologists, turtle farmers, forests, florists, you need a state license to be a florist? What's the damage you're going to do if you don't get a license? Go to jail for not having a license and being a florist, arranging flowers? I mean, give me a break. Our country's gone nuts. Insane. And this is at the state level, not at the federal level. This is where Republicans control, what, two-thirds of all state houses? They control two-thirds of all governorships, at least. Where there are so-called free market Republicans. Where there are Republicans who care about jobs. Where there are Republicans who care about, you know, people. Supposedly free market people, right? So these are supposed to be free market politicians. They could do this. They don't need the federal government. They don't need Democrats to help them. You want to help the U.S. economy? You want to help freedom in America? Republicans, get rid of state licensing laws in your state. All right, let me calm down over this break. You're listening to your own book show on the Blaze Radio Network. All right, I'm uh, broadcasting for Geneva, Switzerland today, and uh, I think I've calmed down a little bit. A little bit. So, yeah, I mean, these licensing laws are insane. And, and, and they restrict human advancement and human flourishing. And, and why do they exist? They exist because of some goody-two-shoes uh, state legislatures who want to so-called protect the public. But really why they exist is because the people in those professions lobby for their existence so that they don't have competition. If you're a barber and you're charging X, you know you want to limit competition and you want to feel like you're important, so you have a license and your profession needs a license. Do you know that computer programmers don't need a license? I don't want to give anybody ideas, but think about it. Computer programmers, these are the people who program, I don't know, nuclear power plants. These are people who program auto, uh, you know, uh, uh, autopilots on, on airplanes. These are people who program medical devices. These are people who, who program every significant device that we run our lives on. They don't have a license. Good. Whew, I'm so glad. Nothing, you know, airplanes don't fall out of the sky because of bad programming. Nuclear power plants have not exploded because of bad programming. Uh, you know, yeah, once in a while we have a bug on, on, on our computer, but generally... Computer programmers do a good job without a government license. How can that be? How can it happen? How can it happen that the government is not protecting us and things are okay? It's insane. Uh, anyway, so lack of mobility because of because of licensing. Yeah. By the way, uh, you can follow me on on Twitter or Facebook. Yaron Brook. Y a r o n b r. Oh, okay, on Facebook, it's Y-Brook, Y-B-R-O-O-K, 
like me on Facebook. Uh, all right. Uh, other, other things that the article mentions that I thought was interesting, growing cultural divide. People in rural America tend to be more religious. People in rural America tend to be less tolerant of immigrants, of gays, of, 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 a, of a different lifestyle. Um, and, they, and they feel, when they go into the city, they feel, uh, I don't know, they, I guess f from the article at least, the people they interviewed there, people feel insecure. Uh, they feel threatened by other people's lifestyle. Again, they, you know, that suggests a, a, a different America, right? I mean, when, when our ancestors came here from wherever, they weren't worried about the lifestyle of the people living in another place. I know, you know, my ancestors who came to America in the 19th century came from little Jewish villages in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of Poland or Russia or Ukraine or Lithuania or wherever. And they came to bustling cities that had everything. I'm sure, you know, they had things that these Jews could not imagine existed. And they survived. They did pretty well, I'd say, in America. They did very well. Because they put their heads down and they worked hard and, 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 and they took care of their kids and they valued education and they did great. And yet today, again, we're such whiners and, and passive and, and want to be taken care of and not willing to take risk. One of the factors mentioned in the article, the last factor really, is the eroding trust in one another. Now, this is fascinating to me. It says that uh, Amer the share of Americans who agree with the statement, quote, most people can be trusted, has fallen over the last four decades to 31%. That's in tw 2016. From 46% in 1972. Now, note, 1972 crime rates were much higher than in, than in 2016, much higher. And yet people trusted each other much more. Now, why is that? Now, there's a lot I can say here, and there's a lot to say about this. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, we have limited time. And I've got two callers on the line. Although, I'll take the callers, uh, Skyla and... and uh, and Jennifer, I'll take the calls after the next break. Uh, and, and there's still one more topic I want to get to today. But um, why is trust in, in decay? And I think, again, this goes to government. When What the government does is it pits us against one another. When the government takes from one person and gives to another, that generates resentment. Is that... The person taking my stuff? Is that the person benefiting from me? When the government regulates some and doesn't regulate others, licenses some and doesn't license others, regulates some more harshly than it regulates others, enforces laws differently for some than it does for others, it engenders a culture, a mentality, a, 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 an attitude among people that is distrustful. When you don't have equality before the law, when you don't have equality of rights, you're constantly looking over the shoulder asking who is, who's with me and who's against me? Who's voting for these bastards who are doing what they're doing to me? So you've got, and this is partially why Democrats hate Republicans and Republicans hate Democrats and they hate each other now. They never used to hate each other the way they do today. But it's because there's so much redistribution of wealth, there's so much control, there's so much regulation, there's so much pitting one person, one group against another. What we have today is group pressure politics. Everybody's scrambling to get their piece of the pie. We don't have individual rights, we don't have freedom, we don't have capitalism anymore. We have a bunch of groups, we have a bunch of uh, a special interests just scrambling to get their piece at my expense. And I resent that, and if I don't trust people. So yeah, trust in America is maybe at the lowest it's ever been. I'm sure it's at the lowest it's ever been. All right, when we get back, we're going to talk more about what the causes, the psychological causes, the entitlement mentality. You're listening to Iran Book Show on the Blaze Radio Network. Hey, you're listening to Iran Book Show, uh, broadcasting today from Geneva, Switzerland, and we're talking about 
this Wall Street Journal article, fascinating article, uh, published a few weeks ago about mobility in America and the fact that Americans are not moving, particularly in rural America. What you're seeing is people in rural America not moving to where the jobs are, not moving to other states, not moving to the cities or to the, or to the towns where the jobs actually exist. I, I've said all along, I've said for, for months, really, for, for, for almost a year now, if you live, if you live somewhere where there are no jobs, I know, I know places that are booming. And, and I use Northwest Arkansas just because I was there and I saw the cranes and I, and I know people there and, and, and it really is a, a, a booming part of the country. And, and it shocks me that people are not just moving there from places that are not doing well. And, and this article has listed a bunch of reasons how government makes it hard for people to move because of the cost of housing in some of these places, because of licensing laws. That's a big one. Be, because of, of, of welfare and all the different welfare programs, including Medicare and local income housing and everything else that actually, it, it, it incentivizes people to stay put, but it's more than just incentivizing people. It is a psychological impact over generations. And, and remember, we've had the welfare state now. Uh, it's suddenly, the, the, the kind of welfare state we have today, we've had since the late 1960s, since the Johnson administration, since the war and poverty began, we've had this welfare state. And the welfare state inculcates a certain mentality. It's a mentality of enti- entitlement, a mentality of victimhood, a mentality of dependence, a mentality of, what is it, of being static, of immobility, of waiting for the handout of just sitting there and waiting. You know, in in Paris, I was in Paris, and and I was in a, I was staying at a very nice hotel in a very nice part of Paris. And all over the streets around it, I noticed the same phenomena. I noticed these families, mother, father, and a child or two, little children. It, It was cold in Paris, and it was raining, sitting in the cold, in the rain, on the pavement, with a handout, basically begging, right? And I've seen this all over Europe, and usually, usually they are um, uh, gypsies. But these were all—you uh, could tell—these were all uh, Arabs. These were all Middle Easterners. Now, it, it, put put aside that fact. But here they are, uh, just sitting there, putting their hand out, and and it it looks organized because, like in every other corner, there's a family, and the families all look the same. I mean, it's almost comical. But that kind of mentality of just sitting. Static, not seeking out a better life. Not, I mean, they at least, I mean, if they're good guys, they at least try, are trying to seek out a better life in the sense that they've moved from Paris, from Syria or wherever to Paris. But in America, there's no excuse for this. There's no excuse for sitting around. There's no excuse for staying in your hometown. I mean, it's a wonderful life. I don't know if you saw the movie, it's a wonderful life. And it's a wonderful life, the hero stays in his little town in spite of the fact that he dreams of going to Paris and having a career and going to the city and doing those stuff. And and there's this notion that it's American to stay in your hometown and to invest in your hometown and to keep your home friends and high school friends. No, that's anti-American. And that movie, by the way, is one of the most anti-American movies ever made, partially because of that. America is about following your ambition. America is about following your dream. America is about grabbing life and, 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 and embracing it and doing what it takes. But a generation brought up, a couple of generations now, brought up on the welfare state. They lack self-esteem. They lack a self-independence. We've driven that sense of independence out of them. We've destroyed their self-esteem. They fear, fear, fear change. And you can see that again in so many people in the electorate, in many of the people who, who voted for Donald Trump. What they fear is change. What they fear is freedom. What they fear is competition. They want things to stay the same. And of course, they don't stay the same. Manufacturing jobs are only going to disappear more. Nobody's going to bring the jobs back. And instead of going and finding better jobs, new jobs, finding greener pastures, they just sit on their butts and go nowhere and do nothing. Not good. Not good. That's not what America's about. All right. Uh, we got Skyler in the line. Hey, Skyler, you, 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 your dad was a Marine. You moved a lot. No, 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 no. I'm a Marine. <laughs> oh, you're a Marine. Okay. Yes. Sorry about that. I'm. That's fine. That's okay. 
Um, no, but just just a few uh, brief uh, biographical details. I started out in South Carolina in training, went to North Carolina, went to Mississippi, went to Arizona, went to California, back to Arizona, back to Delaware. So I, I, I've traveled around the states a few, and I got a chance to, you know, uh, of course, this is government mobility. I mean, yeah. one of the proper yeah. functions of the government, the military. But yeah. I, I, it's just um, one of the opportunities for, for a young guy or a girl um, that wants to break free from little small town life like me with Newark, Delaware. And I wanted to see, I, I went to see the world. I didn't get to, for, there is no God, but God, thank God I didn't get sent to Iraq or Afghanistan. Yeah, no kidding. Um, but, but, um, I, but you, but I you saw the country. States. You saw some states that you might not have seen otherwise. Now, let me ask you, Skyler. Absolutely. So now you live in Delaware. You're yes, back sir. in Delaware. It, 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 yes, if sir. there was an opportunity in Chicago, if there was an opportunity in Nashville or in, or in, uh, or in Houston, Texas, to, to better your life and improve your life, would you pack up and leave Delaware and go? Immediately. I mean, great, without great. hesitation. That like I did the with spirit. the Marines. That with, is with the, the Marines. I said, I, I said, this is my ticket out, and and I'm getting a, a a good compensation from the Marine Corps from retirement, from uh from a medical condition, and I and I appreciate you know the the fact that I'm able, I'm still able minded, still able bodied to do basically whatever job. But I feel like you know since I'm a, I'm a writer, uh, I mean. I can I can use the utilize the internet as as much as I can. Yeah, you can uh, live anywhere. Being a writer is is beautiful because you can you can really live anywhere, <laughs> and that's great. Live anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Well, thanks, thanks, Skyler. Thanks Thank for you, your Pro. service in the military. Thanks for helping defend Thank you, uh, defend our freedoms. And uh, I'm sure we'll be talking soon. And uh, let's see. Let's go quickly to uh, uh, Jennifer in Michigan. Hey, Jennifer. Hi. Um, I was wondering if recently maybe some people from States that have problems, like let's say California, they don't understand the ideas that cause those problems, so they move to somewhere better, and then they bring those ideas with them, and then the same problems happen in a new place, and that might start cutting down on places people can go. I mean, yeah, I think, but people are moving. I mean, people, net migration is into California, so California is still growing as a state. Most of the net migration out, most of the migration out of California is poor people because they can't afford the cost of living in California as they moved to Arizona and Nevada and Texas and other places. Some wealthy Californians have moved, obviously, many of them to Seattle and to Oregon and to, and to other, into Texas. And, and yes, many of them are bringing their lousy ideas and their lousy political views to these other states. Yeah. Uh, but California is still a growing state, so more people are moving in, primarily because of Silicon Valley and Hollywood. If you want to be a movie star, you still go to Los Angeles, and if you want to be, if you want to be involved in a startup, you still go to, uh, you still go to Silicon Valley. I, I, I just wish there was more of that. There, there, there's more of that striving, and I wish people, not as many people, moved into California because California is such a regulated horrible high-tax state uh it's a beautiful state and wonderful people but um still i i I wish people um i i wish i wish california suffered the consequence of its bad policies which it will one day but but uh you know we're delaying that ending um but uh people move but they're they're not moving anywhere like they used to which is again which is sad yeah but yeah it would be good if everybody moved to the states to a freer and and adopted the the politics of the state that were free. Right. They need to realize why they're going there. Yeah, that would be nice. <laughs> that would be nice in our dreams. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Jennifer. Uh, appreciate the call. Thanks for listening. Thanks, Skylar. Thanks, Jennifer. Okay, we're going to take a quick break. Uh, when we get back, we're going to wrap up this topic. Uh, I'm not going to get to talk about anything else today. It turns out. Uh, and uh, but I want to I want to emphasize a few things before we wrap up on this. And uh, we'll have other shows to cover other things. All right, you're listening to your Ron Brooks show on the Blaze Radio Network. We'll be right back. So what has made America special? What, what, what makes America unique, the, the greatest country in human history? It, it really is. It boils down to freedom. It boils down to individual freedom. The freedom to do what? Well, the freedom to live, the freedom to make your life better, the freedom to pursue the values necessary for your own flourishing, the freedom the freedom to pursue your happiness, the ability to do so, and, and, and the, the, where the government protects you and leaves you alone to exactly pursue that freedom. 
that happiness, those values. And as we lose that freedom, and we lose it because the government, to supposedly with the excuse of trying to make our lives better, trying to protect us, trying to shield us from the woes of reality, the government lavishes us with welfare and licensing laws and redistribution of wealth and regulations and controls, all in the name supposedly of making our lives better. But as they do that, as they do that, the unintended consequences, actually, they're not that unintended. The powers, the people in power actually do intend this. The unintended or intended consequences, uh, in other words, the consequences, the consequences, of, uh, a better word for this is the unseen consequences, are that it starts changing the mentality of the country. You see, when America was founded, founded on the principle of individual rights, founded on the principle of liberty and freedom and the pursuit of happiness, people from all over the world came here with the idea of pursuing their own values, of the idea of, of exploiting this freedom to make their lives the best lives that they could have. They came here with dreams and, 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 and great ambition. And Americans, Americans back then, you know, 100 years ago, 150 years ago, 200 years ago, had no problem getting on wagons and driving west. They didn't know what was west. There were Indians in the west. There were people who would kill them in the west. There were, there were, there were real risks in the west, but they wanted that freedom. They were ambitious. They want to get rich, or at least to own some land, to raise a family and, and do it their way without other people telling them how they should live. So, uh, Americans, in their DNA, had this notion of, of going where the opportunities were, of exploiting the freedom that they had in this country, of, of pushing and pushing and pushing the envelope to, to, to living the best life that they could live. And as the welfare state grows, over the last hundred and something years, certainly since the new the the the, the New Deal, certainly certainly since the nineteen thirties, you know, in the in the nineteen thirties and nineteen twenties, people were embarrassed to take welfare. People didn't want to take welfare, even charity. They didn't want. It was a mark of shame. It it hurt their pride. They were proud in their ability to work and to take care of their families, to put food on the table. But slowly. People have become accustomed to the government feeding them, the government providing for them, the government protecting them. And this is not just the, 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 you know, the poor. This is everybody. This is the middle class that wants to be protected from everything, that wants the government to regulate everybody, that, that, that wants everybody to be licensed. And God forbid, you, you shouldn't have to make a choice. The, the, you know, it's the middle class that demands to, to have social security so they don't have to save, to have Medicare, so they don't have to worry about health care when they get old. It's the middle class. It's, it's, it's everybody. It's the whole culture now has become entitled, dependent. And what we've lost is the self-esteem, the independence, the courage, the, the audacity to seek out a better life, to go where nobody had gone before, to do what nobody had done before. You see that spirit. This is why I say in spite of everything, in spite of the politics, in spite of all the horrific policies, I love Silicon Valley because there at least people have imaginations and they follow their ambitions and they pursue their dreams. But other than there and some other places, that we're losing that in America. We're losing it and it's tragic and we've become fearful. And, and we elected a president who reflected that fearfulness. We, we're afraid of strangers, we're afraid of foreigners, we're afraid of competitors, we're afraid of trade. Whoever believed that Americans would be afraid of trade? America, the mightiest, greatest, greatest country in human history, afraid of trading with the Chinese, afraid of competing with, with immigrants coming across the border legally or illegally. But that's where we are today because of the, the government, because of the entitlement, because of welfare, because of because we have re delegated to the government to protect us, to, 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 
to protect us from each other. And each group in America today, each group in America today competes for the pie, for the resources. And now we've started to resent people who have wealth. And it's all the same. It's all the psychology of entitlement, the psychology of need, the psychology of a welfare state. It's a psychology of Europe that now exists in America. And, 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 and that is, wow, that is so tragic. That is so tragic. And that's what we're fighting for. We're fighting to resurrect the spirit of America that existed 150 years ago. We're trying to resurrect the spirit of the 19th century, the spirit of the founders, the spirit of self-reliance and independence and self-esteem and courage and risk-taking. That's what the show is about. That's what we're trying to do on the Iran Book Show. All right. We'll be back next week, same time, same, well, not same place. We'll be somewhere else in the world. Talk to you then. You're listening to the Iran Book Show on the Blaze Radio Network. All right, thanks. So next week, uh, you're doing the pre-tape one. And then the week after that, I'll be in New York. Uh, but we should also test it out like about an hour before, if that's okay. Okay. Thanks, Ellie. Talk to you next week. Bye. All right, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, that's it for today. Those of you asking irrelevant questions, I'll have to get to them another time. All right. Bye. Don't forget to share this. And uh, ideally, share the blog talk version, which will be posted later today, or the YouTube version that will be posted later today. Uh, where we take out all the commercials and it's a cleaner version. All right. See you all later. Bye.